so I'll turn this on and see if it <coughs> works. Well, it is a pleasure uh, uh, to be here uh, and uh, talk about my uh, favorite subject. The first sign of cardiovascular disease is all too often the last because the first sign of cardiovascular disease is often sudden cardiac death. Out of hospital cardiac arrest is really a major public health problem. It claims the life of about 300,000 Americans each year. If you figure that out, that's about the same number of um, of lives that <clears throat> every three or four days that was killed in the uh, Twin Towers uh, attack. And if you're a 40-year-old male, you have a one in eight chance of having sudden cardiac death. If you're a 40-year-old female, you have a one in 24 chance. So it's better to be a female. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> this man was dead, actually he wasn't dead, but he did have uh, cardiac arrest. Brian Duffield, a 40-year-old salesman in Tucson, uh, collapsed in the shower after a swim. Luckily for him, he was on the campus of the University of Arizona. A female off-duty paramedic uh, just came out of the swimming pool uh, and uh, told a guy collapsed in the, in the uh, shower. Uh, she went, said, <clears throat> get me an AED, call 911, and she uh, went in and performed continuous or chest compression only uh, CPR. Uh, the AED got there, she shocked him uh, twice, uh, and he was brought to the uh, University uh, Medical Center uh, for post-resuscitation care. He was in coma uh, uh, and mild hypothermia was begun. We said mild 32 to 34 degrees. This is important because if you cool them below 32 degrees, you cause uh, recurrent uh, uh, fibrillation. Uh, and this is his electrocardiogram. And uh, all I can tell you is that does not show an acute ST segment uh, elevation uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, but he was taken to the cath lab anyway because the most common cause of ventricular fibrillation is ischemia. The most common cause of ventricular tachycardia is a scar. So when they come in with a, a rest, uh, uh, these people, even if they don't have ST segment elevation, and you can see he had the positive white arrow sign that LAD is totally uh, occluded, uh, and this is after it was opened and uh, stent uh, uh, placed in. Uh, post arrest, his uh, and PCI, his uh, ejection fraction was 20%. Uh, he was warmed after uh, 24 hours. Discharged five days later, took a business trip the following uh, week. Repeat echo six weeks uh, later showed a EF of 50% uh, because, you know, uh, post cardiac arrest dysfunction is very common, uh, but it's reversible. Uh, but Newsweek said luckily for him, he was on the campus of the University of Arizona. And the reason for that is because we developed the new CPR. Cardio cell resuscitation, and these are a little bit different than your handout. I never give the same uh, talk uh, twice, but essentially you'll find it. Cardio cell resuscitation has three components. The pre-resuscitation component, which is chest compression only CPR by all bystanders. The cardio cell resuscitation, which is a new uh, approach for paramedics. Uh, and the paramedic fighter fighters, and third, the cardiac arrest center, uh, which is the post-resuscitation care. And this is uh, the three components of the new CPR. Well, what's wrong with the chain of survival, the old cardiopulmonary uh, resuscitation? In spite of standards in 1974, standards and guidelines in 1980, Guidelines in 86, updates of guidelines in 92, further updates in 2000, survival rates for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in most of the world did not uh, change. Uh, and here is about 80 different reports, uh, which shows that the uh, average uh, survival is about 7.5%. Uh, Thank you. A little blip here where the survival was worse was related to uh, 
the group at Johns Hopkins who did a study uh, on patients after they had been arrested for a long time and said, oh, when you press on the chest, it's not the heart they're compressing, it's the thorax. It's a thoracic pump mechanism. And some of you, well, maybe none of you are old enough to remember that the, uh, uh, then the guidelines changed it to 60 beats per minute, uh, and it was absolute disaster. Some of us who'd been running to all the cardiac arrest and pumping like mad uh, said this is ridiculous. And so with the group at uh, Duke, we did some studies to show that no, uh, it needs to be better to 100. But nevertheless, you can see in, in the bigger cities where you can imagine trying to get an ambulance down Park Avenue uh, in New York City, uh, the survival is less than uh, 1%. In fact, in the report from Detroit, they had 538 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and they had one person who left the hospital, and they're not sure of that person's neurological uh, state. So why isn't the chain of survival effective? Because nothing is early. It's all late. It's late access, late CPR, late defibrillation. If you have early access, if you start chest compression and even mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, which I don't like, uh, but if you start that early and you get the paramedics there in three to four minutes and they shock the patient, the patient's going to, they're going to do fine. But the problem is, in most of the world, only about one out of four get bystander CPR. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is the first step of the ABCs is breathing. Second step, I guess, of the ABCs is breathing. And people don't want to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, resuscitation. So the lack of bystander CPR is really a major therapeutic problem. Most individuals will call EMS and then just wait for their arrival. And if they do that and the survival arrival time, like in Tucson, is about seven minutes, you might as well sign their death certificate because they're not going to walk out of the hospital alive. <clears throat> so in our experimental laboratory, uh, uh, survival was dramatically better with chest compression only than no CPR. In other words, we took our swine and fibrillated them and uh, 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 did chest compression only uh, in half the group and the other half the group uh, no uh, CPR until the simulated arrival of the paramedics at about eight, nine, ten minutes. And so we have been advocating, you can see that's 1993, we've been advocating chest compression only, CPR, for a long time, mainly because it's better than doing nothing and three quarters of the people will do uh, nothing. We also discovered <clears throat> that if you pressed on the chest and you didn't get a good coronary perfusion pressure, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, you can't resuscitate the animal. If you pressed a little harder, you can resuscitate them, but they won't survive for 24 hours. But if you get a good perfusion pressure, you can not only resuscitate them, but they'll be uh, fine 24 hours later uh, working around. Now, this coronary perfusion pressure has only been reported once in man, and that's Norm Paradis, uh, and he found the exact same thing. For you to get return of spontaneous circulation, the perfusion pressure had to be at least 15. But, of course, none of those patients survived either because uh, they didn't get a better perfusion pressure. But the interesting thing, it was not the pH. Man, I can't tell you how many uh, animals we, uh, uh, we've, we've looked at. Just to, we're going to correct that pH. We gave them bicarb. Doesn't make a bit of difference. The other thing that was equally surprising, it wasn't the oxygen content. The oxygen content could be terrible. And as long as you're perfusing the body, uh, uh, they uh, do better. But it was the coronary perfusion pressure. Now, what's the coronary perfusion pressure? It's something that you certainly didn't learn in uh, medical school uh, because nobody talks about it. What happens is you're sitting here and, and your heart rate 60 beats per minute. Uh, your heart is beating 100,000 times each day. And every time your heart contracts, the pressure in the ventricle, the pressure in the aorta, and the pressure in the muscle is the same and you get no coronary perfusion. 
but when the heart relaxes, the aortic valve closes, now the aortic pressure is higher than the myocardium and you get all your coronary flow, not all, but almost all, in diastole. Well, it turns out that the exact same thing happens during cardiac arrest. When you press on the chest, the pressure in the chest, the pressure in the heart, and the aorta is all the same, and you get no heart blood flow to the heart when you're pressing on the chest. It's when you release that the aortic valve closes and the pressure in the aorta is higher than that in the coronary artery resistance, which goes through the, uh, uh, the capillaries, through the, the coronary sinus into the right atrium. So the coronary perfusion pressure is the difference between the aortic diastolic pressure and the right atrial pressure. And you can see the old thing was, well, you do 15 compressions, and then you stop and give them two breaths, which you were supposed to give uh, two breaths, two seconds each, so there's four seconds. And then you had to start all over trying to build up the uh, profession. So for years, we've recommended chest compression only because it was better than doing uh, nothing. But to our surprise, survival with chest compression only was as good as the old 15 to 2 when the two ventilations were delivered within the recommended uh, four seconds. And so, you know, we published that uh, uh, study and nothing happened. Nobody paid any attention to it. So we did another one and another one and another one. Those of you in the medical field know that it's, uh, the literature is like trying to catch a fish over Niagara Falls. I mean, uh, nobody reads the medical <laughs> literature any, uh, uh, anymore. So we published six different publications to show that uh, chest compression only was just as good as this ideal CPR uh, and much better than no CPR. And of course, we were disappointed when the 2000 guidelines did not include chest compression only. But soon after they came out, we learned that lay individuals recently certified in chest compression took 16 seconds to deliver the recommended two quick breaths. Uh, this was done over in Cardiff, Wales. They were trying to teach these people how a, a method of doing CPR that they would remember, and so they went through this elaborate uh, certification thing. And then when they're done, they took videos of them doing CPR. And by the time they pressed, finished pressing on the chest, lift the chin, closed the nose, took a breath, made a seal, blew, repeated that, found out where to put their fingers and start pressing, it was 16 seconds. We said, wait a minute. We said chest compression only was just as good as this, quote, ideal CPR that no one has done for the last four decades. The way it's really been done is you're only pressing on the chest half the time. And when we compared chest compression only to that, it was dramatically better than the way we've been taught for the last uh, uh, four decades. So why my chest compression only CPR work in patients with cardiac arrest? It's because in cardiac arrest, the arterial blood is fully oxygenated at the time of the arrest. If I were to collapse right now, my lungs would be full of air. <clears throat> Some people say hot air, but full of air. My pulmonary veins would be full of oxygenated blood. My left heart and the entire arterial system would be fully oxygenated. And if I were to lie there for 12 minutes and you came and drew my arterial blood, it would be perfectly normal because it ain't going anywhere. It's like you've taken it out and put it in the tube and sending it to get it analyzed. It's only when it goes somewhere that it starts using it up. In contrast, respiratory arrest is secondary cardiac arrest. When somebody is drowning, and can't breathe, man, they are upset and their cardiac output is way high and they use up that oxygen fast. The oxygenation is really low and then that oxygenation causes hypotension and then that hypotension causes cardiac arrest five, 10, 15, actually 12 to, to 20 minutes after the breathing stop. Uh, so they're totally different. But the powers that be way back when said, oh, you don't want to have to teach 
lay people the difference between a respiratory arrest and a cardiac arrest? And my answer is, yes, we do. And it's simple. What is a cardiac arrest? It is an unexpected witness collapse in an individual who is not responsive. I didn't say anything about the pulse. I didn't say anything about breathing. Because if you do that, you mess things up, and I'll tell you why. So yes, we want to know that. In Tucson, there's 100 cardiac arrests every year compared to about one drowning death every four years. So we're sort of uh, uh, got our thing from. So it took us and others years of research to discover the importance of continuous chest compression coronary perfusion. But it took one recording of a conversation between a woman trying to resuscitate her husband and the EMS dispatcher for us to learn the importance of uninterrupted chest compression. So what happened, this was in Seattle, the woman had called and uh, said her husband had collapsed and the dispatcher said, okay, we're going to give you phone directed CPR. And so they told her how to do the CPR. This was back in the days where they did 15 compression and, and two breaths. And it must have been an unusual day. It must have taken the paramedics a while to get there because after a while she came back to the phone and said, why is it every time I press on his chest, he opens his eyes, and every time I stop and breathe for him, he goes back to sleep? And I said, out of the mouth of babes, this woman in 10 minutes has learned more about cerebral perfusion than I've learned in 20 years of research. Because what she was saying is, why is it when I'm pressing on his chest, he's not in coma? And when I stop to breathe for him, he's in coma. Uh, <clears throat> and so that led us to that your hands are their heart. If you stop chest compressions for anything, blood flow to the brain stops. So continuous chest compression is the name of the game. So now was there evidence in man to support this chest compression only uh, uh, theory? Well, as a matter of fact, in 2003, when we sort of uh, uh, broke with the guidelines, <clears throat> there were a couple of studies, uh, one from Belgium, one from the Netherlands, that showed that a technique not advocated, in fact, in fact discouraged, not taught, not one nickel spent with, on literature, and not one minute spent teaching was just as good as this technique that we've been spending millions of dollars and millions of man hours and certification uh, to get uh, uh, ready. Now the, the Seattle uh, <coughs> uh, dispatch did a study in which they uh, 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 one day when somebody called in they gave them chest compression only and the other the chest compression plus ventilation and you could see that the uh, survival was better with chest compression only, but because it wasn't significant, the AHA didn't uh, change their uh, guidelines. <clears throat> so in 2003, we decided that we couldn't, in good conscience, continue to follow the current uh, AHA guidelines. So we started uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation uh, with chest compression only uh, CPR. Now this was a <clears throat> uh, presentation I made over in Japan in November of 2002. Uh, and based on that, uh, a couple of years later, uh, the group in Tokyo told their paramedics, when you get there, just write down what's doing. In other words, are they doing no CPR? Are they doing CPR, uh, et cetera. And so uh, in Tokyo, there are uh, 18,000, 18 million people uh, uh, during the night and 32 million people during the day in the city of Tokyo. They have about 10,000 cardiac arrests uh, a year. Uh, and uh, of those, uh, about 4,000 were witnessed. And just like here, uh, about 70% didn't get bystander CPR and 30% did. But the interesting thing was 38% of them were getting chest compression only. Not taught, not advocated, but they wanted to do something, and they didn't want to do mouth to mouth, so they just pressed on the chest. So <clears throat> the 30-day neurological normal survival was 2.2% and no bystander CPR, 4.2% chest compression plus mouth to mouth, 
and 6.2 with chest compression alone. Now you say, gee, those are poor survival rates. Well, they really are because <clears throat> if the patient is not witnessed, uh, et cetera, they're not gonna do well. So if you're studying a technique, you have to take that group that have a witnessed arrest and a shockable rhythm. And if you look at that, the 30-day neurological normal survival was 11% with chest compression plus mouth-to-mouth -mouth and 19% with chest compression alone. Now this was presented in abstract at the 205 meetings, uh, but the guidelines weren't changed because they don't accept abstracts. Uh, and this was uh, published in Lancet in 2007. When it was published in Lancet, uh, they asked me to write the editorial. And in my shy and retiring way, I demanded immediate changes to the guidelines. But the uh, European Resuscitation Council said, no, we wait every five years and we look at all of the literature and then we'll decide at that time. And he said, besides, this was compared the uh, 15 to 2, and in 2005, we changed it to, to, to 30. Uh, actually, 30 uh, uh, to 2. And so they did change those uh, guidelines in 2005 based on no data. It was just a consensus that they knew that, okay, if it really does take 16 uh, seconds to do the two quick breaths, they're not getting enough compression, so we better increase it. So they picked 30 to 2 out of the air. Well, because of that, I went back to the swine laboratory and compared the survival of uh, 30 to 2 with a realistic 16-second uh, interruption. There's your coronary perfusion pressure. There's your cerebral perfusion pressure. When you're not pressing on the chest, there's no cerebral perfusion pressure. And then this is continuous uh, chest compression uh, CPR. and. Uh, uh, you could see in the group that we started bystander CPR four to six minutes after the arrest, which is not too uncommon, uh, the survival was better with the chest compression only. When we published that, the, uh, one of the authorities in uh, Europe said, yeah, but you know, the University of Arizona, their swine model, they gasp when they arrest and people hardly ever gasp. So, uh, uh, so how can we accept the data? Well, we had to rediscover uh, uh, gasping. But first let me say, why are ventilations bad during CPR? For two reasons. One I just told you about, the, the long interruption of chest compressions uh, to do that. But if there's two people there, don't you want one to breathe while the other? And the answer turns out to be, no. And the reason is, is breathing during cardiac arrest is actually harmful. And the reason it's harmful is for the following reasons. I can stand up here and talk to you, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and I'm not fainting. What? Why is that? Why am I not fainting? I don't have a heart in my legs pumping blood up. What's going on? Every time I take a breath, <sighs> air goes in. Why does air go in? because I make a vacuum in my chest. Every time I take a breath, that vacuum in the chest pulls blood back. But if I'm lying on the floor and you're pumping on my chest, the forward blood flow is so marginal that if you breathe in, you increase the inner thoracic pressure and you decrease venous return. And it's actually bad, not good. What really is good is gasping. So. Uh, so what is a recent effort that chest compression only is better? Well, I just presented this a uh, couple weeks ago at the uh, American Heart Association uh, meeting in Orlando. What we did in uh, Arizona, as you know, we've slowly, city by city, uh, getting them to uh, do a chest compression only uh, CPR by uh, bystanders. 798 arrests had uh, chest compression only. 1,232 had standard CPR. And to make a long story short, survival with chest compression only, all rhythms was 10.6 CPR, 6.2. And for witnessed arrest in the shockable rhythm, it was 19% versus 32%. So this is one of the first data uh, that, uh, that shows that, yeah, 
what we've been talking about really uh, translates into uh, increased survival. Now, it just so happened that the Seattle group, <clears throat> as part of the uh, ROC, uh, uh, presented a paper there as well. And they repeated the old study where they did phone chest compression only one day and uh, uh, 15 to 2 uh, uh, the other day. Uh, so they had 1,941 arrests, half of them got uh, chest compression, uh, and the other, the usual. The mean EMS arrival time was 6.5 minutes, favorable neurological outcome, 14% chest compression only. Cardiology, a uh, cardiac etiology of the arrest, which is what we're talking about, witnessed arrests in a shockable rhythm, 20% uh, with uh, chest compression only versus about 13 with that. Uh, uh, oh, and then with the shockable rhythm, 32%, uh, 33% versus 25%. Uh, uh, now, unfortunately, these two things were both abstracts. So the guidelines, when they rewrite them next year in 2005, I have no idea whether they're going to uh, do a chest compression only or not. But we had to rediscover the importance of gasping in patient because Jane Clark, in 1992, listened to dispatches of people calling in that with, with uh, somebody with a cardiac arrest. And she heard gasping in 55% of, uh, uh, of the people. And we then told our paramedics in Arizona, okay, just find out, write down what uh, whether they were gasping or not when you got there. And it turned out that if they were gasping and you were doing CPR, 39% survived. If you're doing CPR and they're not gasping, only 9% survived. So what happens is, uh, uh, and the, uh, you'll find this out, if you start early enough and you start pressing on the chest and you don't let up, you change uh, somebody to compress every 100 compressions. These people will be moving, adjusting their glasses. The, I mean, uh, it, it's scary. And what we used to do is stop when we saw that. But you have to learn that gasping and moving is just a response to good uh, uh, chest compression. Lay people call gasping various things. The most common is snoring. Uh, a woman will say, gee, you know, my husband was snoring in bed last night and woke up this morning and he was dead. So uh, 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 yeah, people have sleep apnea, but if somebody's snoring, shake them to make sure that, uh, that it's just sleep apnea and not uh, uh, the agonal breathing. And again, this is just again in our, uh, in our studies, uh, you start pressing on the chest and these animals will start gasping. Look at here, they're gasping at 30 per minute. So clearly, when do you intubate? You certainly don't have to intubate if somebody's gasping uh, because uh, uh, of that problem. So uh, the three steps, call 911 and put the patient on a floor, on a hard surface, can't be on a bed. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest, the heel of the other hand over there. Lock your elbows. Why do we say that? Because nobody is strong enough. To press. So you lock your elbows and then put your shoulders right over the individual, your knees right up next to them, and fall. Fall. And that is, uh, uh, is what you do, and it takes a lot of work. But equally important is the release phase when you come up because the chest has to recoil. That helps bring blood back from the lower extremities and helps uh, bring uh, air, uh, uh, air in. So it's not cardiac massage that you see on ER. You used to see you know, somebody down there or, or in the emergency room. You, know, you have somebody uh, down there complaining, and they were always stopping to check something. Well, what happened was that they're just too damn tired, but they, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, they're too macho to uh, admit it. So well, let's just see what the pulse is. So what you have to do to those people is say, a hundred compressions and then get off. The, the other person uh, does a hundred compressions. So that's chest compression only. So we also then changed the way the paramedics uh, did. 
And this is based on some new information that's called the three-phase time-sensitive model of untreated ventricular fibrillation. The decades-long emphasis on early intubation and early defibrillation only worked in areas where people were there soon. In the rest of the country, it was bad. So what is this? The first phase is the electrical phase. When the heart starts fibrillating, the most important thing is to shock it and defibrillate it. Uh, so if you're a paramedic called for somebody uh, that has chest pain or something and they collapse right there, you don't do anything, just shock them. Same thing in the emergency room or in the uh, coronary care unit. Somebody fibrillates, you just walk in and shock them. And that's why automatic implantable defibrillators work. And that's why AEDs work in casinos, in, in airports, et cetera, et cetera, because the patient's in the electrical phase. But the problem is, as the heart fibrillates, and fibrillates and uses up all of its energy, it, vibratory waves get very small, and then if you shock the patient, nothing happens because the heart doesn't have any uh, energy to uh, pump. And that's called the circulatory phase. That lasts for about the first 10 minutes, and then after that's the metabolic phase, and we don't know really what to do uh, about uh, there. But in the circulatory phase, it's important to perfuse the heart again so, the, so the, the fibrillation waves will get bigger, and so when you shock it, something will happen. So a shocking during the circulatory untreated uh, does not result in a perfusing uh, rhythm. So what used to happen is uh, somebody would have a cardiac arrest. The uh, uh, patient would uh, uh, call a dispatcher, and the dispatcher would say, oh, are they breathing? Because you, you can't send a paramedic out for everybody that falls on the floor. Uh, so, are they breathing? And they look around, and the guy's going, uh, uh. Yeah, they're breathing. <coughs> well, roll him on the side, you know, so he won't uh, aspirate. And then about three or four minutes later, he stopped breathing. And uh, called back. So the paramedics come. The paramedics get there. What have they been told to do? Put on the AED and give them increasing shocks type three. And when they do that, it kills the patient <clears throat> because you're not perfusing the chest uh, that part of the time. Excuse me one second. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a simple, acceptable way to extend the electrical phase of ventricular fibrillation? Well, a turn is there is. If you perfuse the heart, it'll fibrillate for a long time. Now, the longest I've ever seen anybody fibrillate <clears throat> is 10 days. A uh, patient uh, transplanted, uh, came back in with a rejection, and uh, so uh, Dr. Copeland uh, didn't have a heart at that time, so he put in bivads, so they were perfusing his uh, heart. Uh, he fibrillated, they shocked him several times to try to get him out of the fibrillation, and they couldn't. So they just left him in ventricular fibrillation. So you'd walk in the coronary care unit and see VF on the monitor. You go rushing in the room, and he's reading the Wall Street Journal, checking out his stocks. Uh, and he fibrillated for uh, 12 days. Same thing is if you press on the chest and perfuse the heart, you're more likely to be in ventricular fibrillation when the paramedics get there. So you can extend that electrical phase if you do bystander CPR. <clears throat> okay, so why were the 2000 guidelines not effective? As I said, the EMS never arrived during the electrical phase. And then what they were doing, and, and we've got good paramedics. They're not bad paramedics. They were just following the guidelines. And when we analyzed what they were doing, they were only pressing on the chest half the time. What were they doing? They were intubating. And you, you all know how long that takes. Or they would shock the patient, and they'd see an EKG and feel for the pulse and this sort of stuff. Or uh, they were starting in the IV, or they were doing something. So half the time, they weren't pressing on the chest, and there's no wonder none of them survived. Well, guess what? Halfway around the world, Professor Wick 
in Norway found the exact same time with their paramedics, only half the time. So in the first version of cardio resuscitation, we told the EMS you could not intubate. And you should have seen this when we went out to talk to the uh, paramedics, you know, you can read their body language, you know, and these guys are crazy, you know, we can't intubate. Uh, so we said, no, you can't intubate. Uh, what you do is you do 200 chest compressions. And then you analyze and you give one shock. And so why did we do 200 chest compressions beforehand? Well, <clears throat> for two reasons. If you talk to a cardiovascular surgeon, they will tell you that when somebody fibrillates in the OR, you have to decompress the heart before you can shock it, or otherwise it won't work. Well, what happens in a person who fibrillates, you got an arterial pressure of 120, you got a venous pressure of eight, and when they fibrillate, the blood goes from the arterial side to the venous side, and you get to uh, Guyton's uh, mean circulatory filling pressure. But in one minute, look how big that RV is. And the RV is so big that you have pericardial constriction. And you shock the patient at that time, you got pericardial constriction, Starling's law of the heart on the left side, it doesn't work. So one of the th reasons you have to uh, uh, press on the chest first is to uh, decompress uh, the heart. The second reason <clears throat> is, again, as I said, as they fibrillate for a long period of time, this was in our experimental laboratory, our animals, you could see that the fibrillatory waves get smaller and smaller as it uses up all of its energy. But if we did chest compression uh, for only a minute and a half, you can see how the fibrillatory waves uh, uh, get up. So the coronary perfusion is necessary to refuel the heart. Uh, we came up with 200 uh, compressions because uh, uh, Cobb found out that as he got more and more AEDs on their rigs, survival went down. And he said, gee, what's going on here? In the old days, these defibrillators used to be so heavy and big that one guy would get there and start pressing on the chest, and the other guy would bring the big defibrillator from the rig, uh, and then they would use it. So what he said is, OK, with these AEDs, uh, press on the chest for uh, 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 90 seconds before you shocked him. And you could see that in those, the response time greater than four minutes, their survival was better. Halfway around the world, Professor Wick again uh, did the same thing. When they got there uh, after five minutes, they did three minutes of chest compression uh, first. So we came up, our paramedics said, hey, we don't want to, uh, we don't have to be looking at our watch. So we said, okay, two minutes, 100 compressions a minute, do 200 compressions, and that will be uh, fine. Well, it just so happened that the Rock study group looked at 1,638 VTVFs, and you know the present guidelines are, you know, you don't give the paramedics any guidelines at all. Say, oh, if you want to do it first, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. So following the 2005 guidelines, some of them did chest compression for a little bit, some of them longer. And what they found was what was the best duration? 120 seconds, two minutes. So it was a good guess, wasn't it? <clears throat> so then, after they shock the patient, you can't feel for the pulse. You cannot look at the electrocardiogram. You do 200 more chest compressions. And why 200 immediately after? Well, because that's how you produce pulseless electrical activity. I can produce PEA in anybody. Uh, here is a... a an animal, and you can see we fibrillated him at this point. The arterial pressure drops. These are atrial contractions, uh, but no ventricular contraction. And then you can see after a while, the, uh, uh, the patient, we defibrillate the patient here, and they've got a sort of a nice uh, uh, sinus rhythm, uh, as you can see, and that's pulseless electrical activity. You got a nice EKG, no pulse. And so this what happens is they shock them and they're starting feeling for pulse. You're wasting time because what you should be doing is pressing on the chest. You press on the chest, you raise the pressure, you perfuse it, and pretty soon you're back in uh, sinus uh, uh, rhythm. So 
200 chest compressions, no intubation. They could use bag mouth uh, in our first version. Analyze shock uh, and begin an IV when you can, uh, et cetera. And then after three episodes of this, we said, go ahead and follow the AHA guidelines because they're not going to survive anywhere. And so just do that. And I didn't want to <laughs> rewrite the whole <laughs> guideline. <clears throat> And so what happened to our survival? Uh, witness arrests in a shock couple rhythm in 1992, 9%, uh, and uh, uh, new with bag mouth ventilation, 25%. And then about that time, uh, Alter Heidi uh, came out with his editorial that said, death by hyperventilation. And what they found in their experimental laboratory, as I said, when you're pressing on the chest, the forward blood flow is so small that when you breathe, you increase the thoracic pressure and you decrease venous return, decrease blood flow to the brain and the heart. So uh, they showed that if they really ventilated fast, they could get the animals not to survive at all. So then they took a, uh, a nurse and sent her out with the paramedics, but they didn't tell the paramedics why she was riding with them. And she counted the number of ventilations that the paramedics do at the cardiac arrest. And it is 37 a minute. And we said, gee, isn't that interesting? Back 15 years ago, 1995, when they changed the rate back up to 100 from the old 60, we sent our nurse to the hospital to count how many they were uh, uh, pressing the chest. Unbeknownst to us, she also recorded the number of ventilations. And it was 37 a minute. Doctors and paramedics are all the same. We're at a cardiac arrest, and it's so exciting, and we got the bamboo back, and we're squeezing the half out of them. <laughs> all the pressure. <coughs> Death by hyperventilation. So then we said, well, how can we prevent hyperventilation? Use passive oxygen ventilation. So in uh, 2004, uh, Mike Killam, who was an ER doc up in Rock and Walworth County, Wisconsin, came down and said, gee, I hear you guys are doing something different in resuscitation. I've been in this field for 20 years and we can't resuscitate anybody. Uh, so we told him what we were doing. So we started cardiac cell resuscitation up there, but we said, okay, how are we going to prevent them from hyperventilating, and we said, okay, put in an oral pharyngeal airway, a non-rebreather mask, turn the oxygen up to 10 liters, and guess what? That frees up a paramedic to do uh, uh, something else. So he started this up there, and about <clears throat> every three months, I'd get a call from Mike, and he'd say, man, this is great. Our paramedics are seeing saves they haven't seen in, in years. I said, well, Mike, you got to get some data. Ah, oh, I'm just an ER doc. I don't have time. <laughs> Three months later, man, this is great. And I started screaming at him over the phone. Mike, 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 you've got to get some data. So he did get some data. He looked at the survival the three years before when they were following the 2000 guidelines of uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, and the, those with witness arrest in a shockable rhythm, small <clears throat> county, so they had a fairly good arrival time, uh, was 15%. 48% with cardio cell resuscitation. We could not get that published. Nobody believed it. They thought we were smoking something. I don't know what they thought, but, but it was just too good to believe. In all of the guideline changes in the last 30 years, no one had ever seen uh, that. But we finally got it uh, uh, changed. So then I went up to Phoenix, Arizona and made these presentations it's just sort of like I'm doing to you all today. Not quite as long-winded, but uh, uh, we wanted to start that up there. But the powers that be, really unknowns to me, said, you know what? If we tell these paramedics that they can't intubate, and then we tell them they can't even bag mouth breathe, they're liable to not do it at all. So we told them that we'd like you to do uh, passive oxygen insufflation, but, you know, if you want to do that you can. So they did that. We published that <clears throat> in JAMA last year. They were given the opportunity 
uh, and uh, the uh, mortality with standard CPR went from 4.7 to 17.6. So when we said, well, did the type of ventilation make the difference? And this is just published a month or so ago in the Annals of Emergency Medicine with bag mask, 26%, and with passive ventilation, 38%. So the three-year outcome, neurologically intact outcome at, uh, in, <clears throat> in Wisconsin is now 39%, so it isn't quite the 42 that we had uh, previously, so there was a little Hawthorne effect. Three years uh, in Kansas City where they also weren't allowed to intubate, they, uh, they could do two gentle ventilations after every 50 chest compressions, so it's a sort of a takeoff. They have 38%. So with endotracheal tubes, stack shocks, 10%, with bag mouth, 22%, with passive oxygen inflation, both uh, in Wisconsin, Arizona, 38%. So the question always comes up, yeah, 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 but this is against the 2000 guidelines. We're using the 2005 guidelines now. How does cardio cell resuscitation uh, stack up to that? Well, it turns out that the ROC group, the Resuscitation Outcome Consortium, funded by the federal government, uh, is, consists of some of the arguably the best EMS systems in the uh, country. Their average is 23%, and this is the hospital discharge of cardiac cell resuscitation. So we think that we've got some fairly good data that the system works. And then this brings us to the cardiac arrest centers. Uh, again, because do the paramedics get to intubate? You bet. Once they resuscitate them, then they're comatose. You want to protect the airway while you're uh, bringing them into the hospital, so they're intubated. But it's not a, it's not a rush thing. It's not a, a thing. So they intubate them, they bring them in, <clears throat> and they begin, if they can, hypothermia in the field. They infuse two liters of uh, four degrees centigrade uh, uh, normal saline. And what this does is this starts the cooling process, but it also uh, helps the blood pressure and blood volume because cardiac arrest is just like surgery that you third space a lot of uh, stuff and you, uh, uh, and you need the uh, benefit. So in Arizona, we have designated uh, hospitals as cardiac arrest uh, centers. And to, uh, uh, we met in 07, established the criteria. Uh, in uh, May of 05, they did a study to see if bypassing one hospital and going to another made any difference in survival. And as long as that time was within 20 minutes, it did not make any difference in survival. And these are the, the, uh, uh, the criteria for a hospital to become a cardiac arrest. They have to have therapeutic hypothermia method. Uh, they have to have 24-7 uh, cath interventional uh, capability. They have a system including a protocol for timely completion and submission of this one-page report that we get. That's how we get all of our data in Arizona. It's a voluntary type thing. They don't have to send us the data, but we encourage people to send us the data so that they will know what they're doing. Uh, and we never tell anybody else what this person is doing or that person is doing. It's here's your data. It's 20% but statewide, it's 38%. So, you know, you decide whether you want to do something different or not. Uh, and then it's, uh, uh, they have to have a, a, a termination uh, protocol. And you can see that uh, uh, there are now almost 20, 25 hospitals in the state of Arizona that are uh, cardiac arrest uh, center. Uh, and it does uh, work. Uh, again, in Arizona, the survival to discharge was uh, before cardiac Arrest center designation was 30%. After designation, 56%. So, you know, you do chest compression only, and you get some more survival. You do cardio cell resuscitation by the paramedics, and that improves it. And then you add uh, the third step, the cardiac arrest centers, and now you're getting survival of witness arrest, a shockable rhythm of about uh, 60%. So I want you to learn 
cardio resuscitation, <clears throat> and they say I look a little better with hat and hair, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and to institute uh, the pre-resuscitation of chest compression only by everyone, uh, cardio resuscitation by the paramedic uh, and the cardiac arrest uh, center. So uh, all three have to work together uh, to uh, improve uh, survival. May have been more than you wanted to know about CPR. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, question in the, in the community. You know, this, this becomes a much simpler procedure to train. I mean, if I, you know, if I ask just the people that are present here, just within the fa their family, yeah. how many of them know how to do CPR, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a small number. Um, but, if, you know, with, with this modality, it's something much simpler to train. Yeah. So the community, you know, the number of people yeah. that are trained in right. and, and I can show you data on that. It's another five or six <laughs> slides. But, uh, uh, but we, in Arizona, we, we you know, we, we teach this at the hospital. I would encourage you to have a, a session. We do it once a month on a Wednesday evening. Uh, anybody comes in and they get uh, a taught chest compression only CPR. So I'd encourage you to do that. The paramedics uh, go to uh, home community uh, things, uh, fairs and uh, stuff and teach uh, chest compression only CPR because people are much more likely uh, to uh, do it. The interesting thing is, is that we started this in 2005 and looked at our data in 2009, and the incidence of bystander CPR went from 25% to 32%. So we said, wait a minute. I thought the only problem was they didn't want to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So we did a survey uh, uh, through the uh, cancer people who were good at, at, at surveys, we find out there's five reasons why people don't do bystander CPR. One is they don't want to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and that's about 20%. Another 20% are uh, fear of legal concerns. So, you know, you have to teach people about the Good Samaritan Law. The third consideration is that uh, it's too complicated to do it, so we can't do it. So there, if you taught chest compression only, it would be... The fourth consideration is, is uh, that uh, they're afraid they're going to hurt the person. So you have to say, man, if they're there and non-responsive, they're dead. You can't hurt them uh, uh, anymore or they're pre-dead. Uh, uh, and then 20%, they're physically unable. You know, uh, So you, we could increase it by 80% if we taught chest compression only. Uh, reassured them that you're not going to hurt the person and that there's no uh, legal consequence. So between that time, of those who did bystander CPR, the incidence of chest compression only went from 16% to 77%. So you're absolutely right. If you teach it, those that are willing to do it will, will uh, are more likely to do it. And then, of course, that was the data that we had that showed that survival is much better with chest compression only. Yes, sir? Did you have in uh, your jurisdiction and community simultaneous teaching of both methods by different entities or from a regulatory bureaucratic standpoint? Uh, how did you get the Heart Association to stop teaching people in Arizona we, by the book CPR? We, we didn't. They're still doing it. I mean, we've, we've had people that weeks ago had to go get certified and they were uh, you know this is the same instructors and they you ask them about chest compression only and they say well no 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 we don't we don't we don't do that you know it's you have to do the ventilation but we sent out flyers and I could show you the flyers if you want uh, to every household in Tucson and in Phoenix we did celebrity uh, things some uh, uh, as you know, I'm director of the Sarver Heart Center. Sarver happens to own the Suns in uh, Phoenix, so uh, we would have them uh, doing chest compression only CPR on a gorilla, uh, which is their mascot. Uh, 
uh, uh, in 2005, we actually got the governor to write a letter that says, uh, you know, because we had all of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the data that we ought to do with them. In March of 2008, there was an AHA advisory that uh, said, if you're unwilling or unable to do chest compression, do, uh, or both do chest compression only, so that's from the AHA, and the AHA now uh, are going to come out with a media blitz that is going to recommend chest compression uh, only. Uh, but it's like everything else they do there. It's you have to buy the the tape or the disc that uh, shows you how uh, to uh, to do it. Whether they'll chart the guidelines, uh, we don't know. But you just have to do it. You just have to do it.